Hi, and thank you for tuning in to Gavin Lon Digital. I'm Gavin Lon. So in the last part of this course, i.e. the fourth part, we created the database for our web application and added the ASP.NET identity tables to our database through the use of EF core migrations. We also extended the ASP Net Users Identity database table through a data migration to include additional fields, which will be used for the purpose of capturing additional information for a user when the user registers with our web application. These additional fields are first name, last name, address one, address two, and postcode. We needed to create these additional columns in the ASP.NET users table because the identity system does not provide us with these fields by default. Please view the fourth part of this course before proceeding with this video. A link to this video has been included below in the description. So let's start this video by creating a new data migration. Before we do this, please consider subscribing for more content like this and much more. And please ring the bell so that you'll be notified of future content. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It will be greatly appreciated. So in the previous video, we created the migration to add the additional fields, first name, last name, address one, address two, and postcode to the ASP.NET users table. If we look at the ASP.NET users table in our database, we can see that the new fields that we have added are of type nvarchar. If we look closely here, we can see that the definition of the nvarchar data type contains the keyword max in brackets here. The maximum size for a column of type nvarchar is two gigabytes of storage. Since nvarchar uses two bytes per character, that's approximately one billion characters. We don't need these fields to allow for the storage of such large data sizes. So to restrict the size of the relevant nvarchar fields, we can declare the string length attribute against the string properties in the application user class. Now this is why it is called code first migrations. We first modify the code before we create the migration code to alter the database accordingly. So the attribute we will declare is named string length. We'll look at how to apply the attribute in a bit. We can then run the add migration command from within Visual Studio 2019 using the console package manager window. By running the add migration command, the code to appropriately modify our ASP.NET users identity table will be generated for us in the form of a migration. The migration code will be generated based on the code changes we will make to the application user class, i.e. by appropriately applying the string length attribute to the string properties in the application user class. Once the migration has been created through the add migration command, we can then run the relevant migration code by running the update database command. Running the update database command will commit the changes detailed in the migration to the database. So let's do this. Let's alter the application user class to include our changes. So we can restrict the size of the fields to a specific number of characters using the string length attribute. The string length attribute can be found in the system.componentModel.dataAnnotations namespace. So let's ensure that we include the appropriate using directive at the top of our code. Let's declare the string length attribute against the string properties in the application user class. This exercise highlights the code first data migration process. Code is altered first then we create the migration based on our code changes, and then we commit the changes detailed in the migration to the database. So let's update our code first. So we can declare this through the use of the string length attribute like this. So let's say we want the last name field to have the same restriction, same for address one and same for address two. And finally, let's say the postcode field can have up to a maximum of 50 characters. I know this is probably way too many characters for a postcode, but let's err on the safe side. The next step is to create the migration based on the changes we have just made to our code. So let's invoke the package manager console window. And then in the console window, let's type in add migration, and then let's give this migration a name. So 
Modify length ASP.NET users custom fields is the name of our migration. Let's press the enter key to create our migration. And there it is. Our migration code has been created for us. And if you look at the instruction automatically generated in our package manager console window, you can see that we can remove the migration that we have created by running the remove migration command. The remove migration command simply removes the last created migration. As long as the update database command has not been run to commit the changes detailed in the last created migration, running the remove migration command will remove the last created migration. So let's do this. Let's type in remove migration and then press the enter key. And you can see that this command has removed the migration that we named modify length ASP.NET users custom fields. But we do want to create a migration based on our last code changes. So let's generate the relevant migration again. So as we did before, let's run add migration and name the migration modify length ASP.NET users custom fields. And now to commit the changes detailed in this migration to the database, we must run the update-database command. Great, so let's look at our database in SQL Server Management Studio. And you can see that the relevant fields of type nvarchar have been restricted to the sizes that we declared against the relevant properties in the application user class. Hypothetically, what if we felt that we had made a mistake in our last migration and we in fact want the relevant fields to allow for the maximum amount of data that can be stored for the nvarchar data type? We have now run the update-database command, so we can't run the remove migration command to undo this mistake because we have already run the update database command to commit the erroneous changes to the database. We can actually roll back our changes against the database by running the update database command, but in order to roll back our changes to the database, we must specify the name of a particular migration. This particular migration is the point at which we feel the state of our database is correct. So after the particular migration was run, through the update database command. This is the state of the database that we want our database to be in at this point in time. So the last migration we ran committed changes to the database that we wish to undo. We can type in update database and then include the name of the migration that we ran at a point in time prior to when we ran the last migration. And let's look at SSMS to see if we have rolled back the changes to the database. Great. Notice that although we have undone the changes to our database that was caused by running the last migration we created, the last migration we created is still in the migrations folder. So it is now possible to remove this migration through the use of the remove dash migration command. But we only did this exercise for learning purposes, so we want to keep this migration. So let's not run the remove dash migration command. In fact, let's run the update dash database command to commit the changes in our modify length ASP.NET users custom fields 
migration once again. Let's look at our database through the use of SSMS to confirm that our changes have been made successfully. Excellent. So up till this point, we have been creating and running our migrations through the Package Manager console window from within Visual Studio 2019. This is a very convenient way to manage our migration functionality, but note that we can also manage our migration functionality through our command line if we choose to do so. At this point in the course, we should all have .NET 5 SDK installed on our computers. If you haven't yet done so, please view the second part of this course for details on how to install the .NET 5 SDK. I have included a link to this video below in the description. When running our migration commands using the .NET CLI, the migration related commands are different to the migration related commands that we have run using the Package Manager console window. So before we go into the syntax of the migration commands, that can be run using the .NET CLI, we need to be cognizant of the fact that the .NET EF tool that we will be using to run our commands is no longer part of the .NET Core SDK. This change allows us to ship .NET EF as a regular .NET CLI tool that can be installed as either a global or local tool. We want to install the .NET EF tool as a global tool, so we need to run this command at our command prompts. .NET space tool space install space dash dash global space .NET dash EF. I'm not going to press the enter key to run this command because I have already done so. So in order to run the migration related commands for the relevant project, we need to make the directory where the relevant c -sharp project file resides, our current directory. The project file is of course the file that has the .csproj file extension. So this is my current directory. If I type dir at the command prompt, you can see that the relevant file, i.e. the file with the .csproj file extension is in this directory. Note the commands I'm about to demonstrate don't need to be run because we have already run these commands using the package manager console window. The syntax for running the equivalent commands through the .NET CLI is different. So I'm only doing this demonstration to show you the difference in syntax. This may be useful to you if you wish to run your migration commands through the .NET CLI instead of using the Package Manager console window. So once we have made the directory containing our project file, our current directory, we can run our EF core migration commands. So to add a migration, the syntax looks like this, .NET space EF space migrations space add and then you include the name of the relevant migration. This is the equivalent of running the add migration command in the package manager console window. The relevant migration will be generated in Visual Studio once you have run this command successfully at your command prompt. I'm not going to press enter because I don't want to run this command. To remove a migration, the command will look like this, .NET space EF space migration space remove. Once again, I don't want to run this command, so I'll remove it from the command line. This is the equivalent of running the remove dash migration command in the package manager console window. So let's say we have a migration that we wish to commit to the database. To commit the changes for the relevant migration, the command will look like this, .NET space EF space database space update. This is the equivalent of running the update dash database command in the package manager console window. If you wanted to roll back certain changes that have been made to the database through certain migrations, the command would look like this, .NET space EF space database space update, then include the name of the migration that denotes the state of the database after that particular migration was run at some point prior to your latest migration or migrations. So for example, if we wanted to roll back the changes 
we have made in terms of the length of the fields that we created in the application user class through the use of attributes, we could type .NET space EF space database space update space extend ASP.NET users table. The extend ASP.NET users table migration denotes the state of the database before we ran the migration that modified the lengths of the fields denoted by the properties in the application user class. So we are essentially updating the database to a state before changes in the modify length ASP.NET users custom fields migration were committed to the database. So we have looked at code first migrations in a fair bit of detail in this video. We are going to use code first migrations to generate what I've referred to as our custom tables in the next video. I've used the word custom to refer to the database tables that are not the automatically generated identity tables. Please view the third part of this course for more details on the database design for our application. A link to this video has been provided below in the description. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing for content like this and much more and please ring the bell so as to be notified of future content. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel will benefit from its content. I really enjoy engaging with you in the comments section, so please feel free to share your thoughts with me in the comments section. A link to the relevant GitHub repository where you'll find the latest code has been included below in the description. Thank you and take care.